Okay. So, questions on that before we move? So that kind of wraps up the basics of ER diagrams. Um, and then, so as remember, an ER diagram is kind of like the middle step between concept and solution. So, in the, the programming analogy, you have a concept, you write C++ code, that's the middle step, you eventually end up with a program. So any questions on this before we move on to, okay, now when we have the middle, the middle step, how do we convert that into an actual database or a set of schema? Okay. So I'm going to, before we talk about how to translate ER diagrams into schema, and there's a mechanical algorithm for doing it. You just have to apply the rules and then you'll get the right answer. So before we talk about that though, I'm going to talk a little bit about SQL, how to create tables in SQL in order to give it just a little more context. So this is kind of the, um, this is not a specific create table command, this is showing like there are placeholders here. So create table is, is a key phrase and then, so anything inside of angle brackets here is like a, something that you would replace with a real name or, or value of some sort. So create table name and then in parentheses we just specify the attributes. So this is basically creating a table is creating a schema. And remember a schema is just a bunch of attributes, the column headers. So I say, I, gi I give the column one a name, I give it a type, and then I give it some properties optionally. But name and type are always required for each column. And notice it's kind of, it's kind of weird here. The, Column name, type, and properties are just space separated, and each column is comma separated. And then after the last column, we can add additional properties that apply to the entire table. Okay. So, um, what can these types be? So remember, it's name, then type, and properties. So what is a value? What is a valid uh, thing to put in for a type? Uh, just like programming languages, there are lots of different, you know, primitive types, integral types, real numbers, strings, things like that. So there are a lot of different integer types based on, these are just kind of different sizes, so like char versus short versus int versus long. Um, we can specify, so I can just say int and that will give me a default int. Or I can put a modifier in front of it, I can say tiny int. So there's stuff inside of angle brackets, you could pick one of those followed by int so I could get big int or medium int. And then optionally after that I can put unsigned and there's uh, a space there so if I wanted unsigned it would be int space unsigned. Various forms of real numbers, float, double, decimal. Uh, decimal lets you specify exactly where the decimal place goes with regards to the number of digits on either side of it dates. So most languages don't have a primitive, pro programming languages don't have a primitive date type. Uh, database languages usually do have a primitive date type because dates are just everywhere in databases. Right? Almost, almost everything that happens in a database you want to know like when did it happen, uh, what, what day did it happen on. So various forms, you can get just the timestamp, just the time, a date plus a time, you know, lots of things that um, it's kind of up to you to go figure out which types you need to represent your problem. Strings. So there are two forms of strings and neither of them are called string. Um, there's char and varchar and we specify the size here. And the size means a slightly different thing for, for each of these. So char is exactly m characters. Varchar is up to m characters characters. And then, you know, I'm, just, I'm still not even showing all of the SQL data types, but um, we need to be able to store basically anything, and so it gives us the option of doing that by just storing some raw bits. It's called a, a blob, binary large object. Okay. <clears throat> so let's talk about strings a little bit. This one's 
these are used a lot, and this one's kind of this one's a little more interesting. Um, so exactly n characters or up to n characters. So um, now having now knowing that, and it may, a string may not come into play in all these answers, but let's just do a couple little quizzes. So the checked out table from the library. Um, what is the best type for cardinal? Yeah. Int. I would agree, at least int, maybe any of big. Big, big int, maybe if we need like tons of them. Unsigned. Unsigned, yeah. So some kind of unsigned int. Int is actually probably even too big. We probably won't have like billions of library patrons. But those extra couple bytes are not gonna not gonna matter too much. Okay, best type for author in the titles table. Yeah. Var char, yeah. So I, it's a string, so it's either char or var char. But you know, obviously, we can see even right here there are strings of different length. Char would not work. So var char, and then the question is, how big do we make it? And we'll, we'll kind of answer that in a second. Yeah. May I ask you, what is the difference between a uh, var char and a uh, char with spaces in it at the end? So the difference between a var char and a char with spaces at the end? Um, var char kind of just more naturally supports dynamically sized strings. So you can, yes, you can pad a char with spaces at the end. The other difference is, um, so var char, it's, it's, it's mostly like a design decision. If you know that the type should be exactly this many characters, then let the system restrict the data and give the data more integrity by specifying exactly that many characters. Is there another one over here? Yeah, what if we try to put the data to not pass the characters? Bar chart is not still in the code. Should that be? Is that supposed to be a different type of data? So what if the author was some different character encoding? Yeah. You can specify the character encoding when creating the table. So if you wanted UTF-8 or ASCII or whatever, you can specify that. And there's a default. You usually don't have to specify, and the default is usually a good choice. Okay, best type for ISBN. Char, bar char, uh, maybe even int, but as shown here, int won't work. Um, so char versus varchar. They're all, all of these ISBNs are going to be the same length. So we use 14 chars. Um, if we wanted to get rid of the dashes, we don't you know, necessarily need to store them in the database. When printing them, we could reformat it and insert a dash when printing it. Then we could use an int, some kind of, some kind of unsigned int. So in terms of data storage size, would it make a difference? No, I mean, no, just because the number of lines is definitely changed. So we use an int that we can store all of the data. Okay, so if you use an int, you're potentially, yeah. If you use an int, you're potentially allowing for values outside the range that we actually want to store. Um, you could, you could insert other SQL um, restrictions on what values can go into a column. But yeah, I think char 14 is probably the answer that we want here. OK, so streams. You know, basically, it's, it's pretty straightforward. If, if you know exactly how many characters, use char. If you don't, use var char. And then the question is, um, how do we pick the size for bar char? So it requires at least n bytes for the storage itself. And then it also needs an additional byte to know how long the, the string potentially is. So the way, how many numbers, how many different values can a byte represent as a size? 0 through 255. So if 
the length of our string, if we specify that the length is between 0 and 255, then you only need one byte for the size. If it's larger than that, it goes up to two bytes for the size. So tiny bit of extra overhead there to think about. Uh, this usually doesn't really matter too much. But so basically the rule is pick the smallest value that is always large enough. So if you pick a value that's too small and you want to change it, you can update this, the schema. You can update the table. And that is changing all the Yeah, so it would change the, the existing table. So you usually want to try to get this right the first time. Yep. How does this work with huge amounts of text, like paragraphs or books? So how does this work with huge amount of, amounts of text? For that, you would probably want to use a blob, like a different format. Okay, so that's types, you know, pretty straightforward. Just pick the, pick the right type for the meaning of the, the information you want to store. And then we can put properties on these tables, on these columns and tables that are usually restrictions. So this is um, like a design principle allowing us to specify that the data should have a certain type of integrity. So these are, like, these are ways of specifying integrity constraints. So I can say none of these values in this column can ever be null. Uh, you can give it a default. Auto increment is kind of just a, a uh, quality of life helper. So anytime you insert a row into the table, that particular column will just get one uh, the next value up automatically increment. And then properties on the entire table, things like keys and uniqueness constraints. Yep. So if you have an auto increment, in most cases it makes sense that that's your identifier. Right, so if you have auto increment, it's probably an identifier, like an ID. Yep. Okay, so not null. And these are not all the properties. These are just kind of a couple of the ones we're looking at today. Not null um, is not just for integrity constraints. It, it also helps the DBMS with, with performance optimization. If it's building an index around a certain column, not null uh, makes its job easier and, and able to do that. So basically, you should always use not null if the values if, if you don't need the values to ever be null. So let's just think about like, let's look at, here's an example. Um, so ISBN is probably the key, that can't be null, clearly. Um, should we allow author to be null? Like, no, all books have an author. We could, leave that property off. We don't have to specify not null and it would still work. But we should specify it. We might as well specify it because it'll, it'll improve the DBMS's uh, indexing structure. Okay. So, we're not, we're not looking at types now, we're looking at properties. And so I'm saying what are the appropriate properties for Cardinum? I want both the properties for that column and any table-wide properties that apply to that column. So in other words, keys. So what are the appropriate properties for the cardnum column? In, this is the patrons table, not the checked out table. One would be auto increment for cardnum. Okay, auto increment, yeah. So we don't want to have to keep track of the count here. We can let the database system, anytime a new patron is added, just let it figure out a new ID, a new unique ID. And primary key. It's the identifier, so it is the primary key. Not null. And not null, yes. So it turns out if we specify primary key, we automatically get not null, but it's better to be clear. So we'll specify it as well. Okay. Appropriate properties for card num, but in a different table. So in the check deck table, what properties should it have? Not null. Not null. 
Uh, what about auto increment? No. No, definitely not. Um, primary key? Kind of, well, we haven't really given enough information. But for now, really all we can say is it should not be null. Okay. So let's, let's actually just do a little uh, example. So we're going to create the titles table for the, for the library database. So here is an SQL command window, command terminal. I've already logged in to the database and I'm using the library demo database. Um, I can do show tables and there are none. So this is just a uh, from scratch database with nothing in it yet. So we're going to create the titles table. Create table titles and then open parentheses. And then I can split commands into multiple lines if I just press enter. So command is not done until I type a semicolon. So I'm just doing this because my font is so big I'm going to have to wrap, I'm going to have to use multiple lines here. So now we just have column properties, comma separated. Or sorry, column, column types, names, and properties, and then comma separated. Question first? Okay. So ISBN. And then space, and then it's type. We decide it should be char 14. And then properties. So we want not null. Do we want like auto increment? No, you can't auto increment a string. Um, and it wouldn't make sense anyway. An ISBN has to be a specific value. You can't, no. <laughs> um, primary key? Yes, but it doesn't go in the column properties. We'll do that at the end in the table properties. Okay, so there is ISBN. Title should be a varchar. Um, I will make it 255, just as um, up to the point where we can represent a size with one byte. Probably bigger than any title of a book will ever be. And not null. Okay. Author, also a varchar. Okay, so those are the columns, and then now I can put in the table properties. So we want primary key is ISBN. And then some additional information. We probably want, this is actually kind of taken from one of the problems in the homework. We probably want for one author to not be able to publish the same book twice, this, this, uh, uh, two different books with the same title. So the way we would specify that is we just say unique. So this is an additional candidate key. And then I can just put in the combination of title and author. Okay. Semicolon. Okay, so I've created the titles table. Now if I do show tables, there it is. I can do describe titles. It's going to be formatted very poorly with my giant font. Oh, no, actually it fits. Okay, good. Um, it barely fits. So this just kind of shows you this is, it's drawing a table here. This is not the titles table. This is information about the titles table. And it just formats it as a table. So it has field type, various properties. So it says null on all of those. Um, it says ISBN is the primary key. Um, it also says that title that key mole, that means it is part of a key, that additional key. Um, it unfortunately doesn't 
doesn't really describe it very well because author doesn't show that as well, but you can get more detailed information out of a table than this. I can do show <coughs> create table titles. Now it's not formatted proper, formatted very well with my giant font, but this basically gives you a command that will reproduce that table. You can't specify the primary key as a column property. That that always goes as a table property. So that's, the that's just the syntax. Did the database name that unique key, or and is that something we can give it a name? Um, that um, title key. Right. So I did not specify the names of these keys, and so it gave them a name. So it will automatically make one up. Uh, but it's just kind of a, a shortcut. It, it, if you don't specify a name, it'll make one up. Some other um, clients will make up kind of more random looking name, uh, key names. This one kind of makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So let's do another one. Now I'm going to add the inventory table. This one will be even a little shorter. So I'll create table inventory. It has a serial, which we decided should probably be int unsigned. It should be not null. Anything else? Serial number for a book in the library. How do I do it? Okay. And then ISBN, which since it's going to be re referencing another table, we have to make sure it has exactly the same type as that column in the other table, which was char 14. And we also want it to be not null here. Okay. Primary key is serial. Okay, easy enough. Now I want to, sh I want to describe inventory. So I get not allowed to be null, primary key, okay? I wanted to show you again, I'm gonna drop that table, delete it. And I'm gonna just recreate it, but this time I'm not going to specify that the serial number has to be not null. And then I'll describe it again and we automatically get it is not allowed to be null because it's a primary key. Okay, any questions so far? Yep. So you can, so I, what I just did is I just deleted the table and started from scratch. There is a way to modify the table um, without deleting it. We'll get to kind of the more detailed SQL syntax later. Today I'm just trying to get to enough that we can translate ER into schema and think about it in the context of tables. So you said we have to remember the exact type of the uh, column in the other table. Yep. Is there a way to refer to that? Like make it the same type as some other table like syntactically rather than just remember? Uh, unfortunately no, but you can easily just go describe the table and get the exact type to put in there. Yeah. Um, when you say like ISBN, for example, has to be the same in the other table, that includes properties as well as like it's the whole thing. Or so it does. So it has to be the same type as in the other table. It does not necessarily include properties because they can have a different meaning if it's if it's just a foreign key used as a foreign key. Right. Speaking of which, so we're not quite done yet. The, the inventory table is not complete. Um, 
So the way we specify a foreign key in during table creation, we can also add this after the fact, is we say foreign key and then the column within this table references some other table and then the column within that table in parentheses. And then we can specify what we want to happen on delete or on update with some sort of action. So action can be restrict, cascade, set null, set default. Um, restrict means you cannot do it if it would interfere with, with some foreign key. Cascade means, so like if you delete it from the referenced table, then it's deleted from the referencing table. And we saw the other option was set null. There's also set default. So every column has a default value, which by default is null. Um, so they'll be kind of the same thing unless you specify, I want the default value to be Bob or whatever. OK, so now I'm going to, let's drop inventory again. And this time create it with, so after primary key, I do foreign key. What is the foreign key? Let's look at. Here's the full library. Uh, we're only dealing with titles and inventory. I'm modifying the, I'm recreating the inventory table. So any foreign keys? Yeah. The ISBN. Just the ISBN. Serial number, what about that? That is not a foreign key in the inventory table. That's a foreign key in the checked out table. It depends on which way the reference is going. So I want foreign key um, ISBN. References titles ISBN. And then I can do on delete cascade or something like that. Okay. Right, so ISBN has to be a key in the referenced table. And this has to be done inside the primary key? Before, uh, no, there's a comma there. So primary key serial, comma, foreign key ISBN. It's all on one line, so it doesn't, doesn't look as nice. So can the foreign key have a different name in one table? Can, it, can the foreign key have a different name? Yes. But let me drop the table again and recreate it. But this time I will do um, ISBN is an int. Foreign key constraint is incorrectly formed. So it knows that that's not the right type to refer to the foreign ISBN. What happens if um, you set the, if, if a column has a not null property, but its default value is null, and it's a, a foreign key, and you ask it to set default on delete? So if you, if you have non-null and um, set default null, um, those are kind of conflicting ideas, and it'll, it'll not work. Uh, over there, yeah. Does cascading deletes go back both ways? <coughs> Do cascading deletes go both ways? No. So um, let me create this again the, the correct way. So show tables. What I have is inventory references titles with a foreign key, with, with cascade on delete. So what that means is if a book is deleted from titles, any corresponding entries in inventory will be deleted. If I delete a book from in inventory, it will not affect titles. And that's exactly what you would want. Like, let's, if a book gets deleted from titles, that means that no copies anywhere, that book no longer exists. Like, all copies of the book were burned or something. <laughs> good old-fashioned book burning. Um, <laughs> if I delete a book from a library, that just means, well, I don't know, their copy got destroyed or lost. It doesn't mean that the, the book doesn't exist anymore somewhere else. So, so the foreign key has to be a key in its own table, right? 
or does it not? The foreign key does not have to be a key in its own table. No, it has to be a key in the foreign table. Sure. <coughs> okay, so you have two tables. One contains the foreign key. So it has to be a foreign, like the foreign key has to be a key. Right, so you have two tables. One of them has a foreign key. So right. in this case, inventory has a foreign key yeah. um, of ISBN. Yeah. But ISBN is not a key in inventory. Okay. ISBN is a key in titles. Okay, so it could potentially be duplicated in inventory. Yes, it can okay. be duplicated in inventory. And in fact, um, it is even in our example. Like we have two copies of that first book. And two copies of that 379 book. I see. I see. That makes sense. So is it possible for a table to have multiple foreign keys? Is it possible for a table to have multiple foreign keys? Yep. So um, we actually have an example of that here in the library. What is it? Checked out table. So card num is a foreign key to patrons, and serial is a foreign key to inventory. Is it possible to change the table property um, externally, like not when you're creating the table? Can you change the table property later? Yes. You can, keep, you can keep the contents of a table and change properties of the table most of the time. Um, sometimes it would kind of conflict with the current contents of the table. Yeah. Okay. So let's take our, our break now, and then we'll talk about how to mechanically convert an ER diagram into schema. So now that we have some context in concrete SQL terms, so how do we translate an ER diagram into a relational model, or in other words, into schema. Um, what we've been doing is technically a correct relational model, but sometimes results in extra tables or extra columns. Um, and we'll see how this will affect the library example. But so this is why ER diagrams are important. Is if you think about it in that context first, try to ignore tables. Just think about it in entities and relationships. Then once you've come up with a good ER diagram, you can mechanically and procedurally get a good set of tables. Okay, so the basic algorithm is every entity set becomes a schema. Okay, that's straightforward. If it's a rectangle, it becomes a schema. Uh, except for um, well, yes, yes, pretty much always rectangle becomes a schema. Relationship sets might become their own schema depending on the cardinality of the relationship. If they don't become a schema, then they get merged into some other schema. So we have to take their information and incorporate it into another table. Okay, so entity sets. Every Entity sets translates to a schema, which means we basically just take its attributes, the little ovals, and make those columns in the table. Very straightforward. And then one of those ovals will be underlined, at least one of them. Um, we just we take the exact same meaning, whatever the key is of the, of the entity set, we make that the primary key of the table. If there are multiple key sets, then we pick the one that makes the most sense as primary key, being smaller or integer type. Yep. So here's a, here's a simple example. So we have employees work in departments. Um, the entity sets and the relationship set all have their own attributes. So entity sets first, they're easy, super straightforward. They become tables. So. Um, SSN name and pay for employees, DID, D name and budget for departments. And then I have here primary key for SSN, primary key for DID, and not null for all of them. So not null is kind of just, there, there's not like a strict rule where if it's an attribute it has to be not null. You just think about it. So 
would it ever make sense? Would you ever want to represent an employee that doesn't have a name or an employee that doesn't have a pay? If the answer is yes, then you leave the not null off. Otherwise, just put not null on there because it'll improve optimization in, in the underlying engine. Okay, and then what about the relationship set? What do we do with it? So as is, these two tables do not represent the right information. We don't have any way of saying that an employee works in a department. So the answer is it depends on the cardinality. Right now I'm not showing the cardinality here. So we'll go through the various possibilities. If it's many to many, um, then the relationship set becomes a schema. Okay? So the relationship set turns into this table. It has at least the since attribute. Like how long has that employee worked for a department? And then I just left question marks there. So what's what's missing here is how does this how does this table relate an employee to a department? So let's think about it in terms of sets. So if I have the employees set, the departments set. And then remember, relationships are sets too. It's a relationship set. So I wrote the like works in here, referring to the blue lines. That's also a set. So I have three sets. And let's kind of just write some, fill in some example instance data. So one of these dots, let's say they have an SSN of like 1-2-3 and a name and you know some pay or whatever. So there's, there's one tuple in the employees set. And then maybe a department has an ID, um, a department name, uh, whatever else a department might have. But what we need is, what is it that makes a reference between these two entities? It's basically, it's, re it's, it's linking up or tying together two full entities. But do we need the full information in order to link them together? We all, what we need is some way to uniquely identify the entities on both ends of this line. So the way that an employee is uniquely identified is the SSN, and the way a department is uniquely identified is the DID. So those two pieces of information together are enough to represent this Blue, this particular blue line. So we add the keys of the two entity sets that we are relating as columns to the relationship table. So we get SSN from the left entity set, we get DID from the right entity set, and then we make them foreign keys because that is exactly what they mean. They're pointing to something else in another table. This schema is a weak entity, right? So the the works in schema is a weak entity? Is it? It's not really. I mean, kind of the same idea that it doesn't really make sense without the other two things. But it, this didn't come from a weak entity set. This came from a relationship set. But I kind of see where you're going there. Like, it, it doesn't make sense. One of the tuples in this table doesn't make sense without an employee's tuple and a department's tuple, which is why it has to be foreign keys yeah. to link them together. So what would the primary key be? Yes, excellent. So what is the primary key for this table? So remember, every table has to have a primary key. Foreign keys are not keys. They don't make up, they don't make up primary keys. So back to so this, so this question. Now, which of these or some combination of these columns makes up the primary key? So back to this drawing here. Basically, we want to know, how do I uniquely identify each of these lines? And it's essentially like kind of the same answer we already came up with. The endpoints of a line is what identifies the line. The endpoints are technically full entities. But in order to identify just 
those entities, we only need those entities' keys. So the key for the relationship schema is the combination of its two foreign keys, the two things that it is tying together and, and bridging. So here's the full table now. I have um, SSN and DID are both separate foreign keys, and they are combined with the primary key. So the primary key spans both these columns here, but foreign key separately in each of these columns means they're pointing, they're completely different foreign keys. So this would just limit um, one employee to work in a department once in there. Right, so one employee can work for any particular department only once yeah. in this table. But they would be able to work there at multiple time periods. So would they be able to work there at multiple time periods? No. Uh, not with the way we've drawn it here. If we wanted that, then we would have to change the key. Or actually, we would probably, we would probably not have started with this ER diagram if we wanted that. We would have used a ternary relation. This ER diagram doesn't allow for an employee to work for the same department for two different durations. And remember, there's like there's no wrong or right. This is this ER diagram means an employee cannot work for a department for two different durations. If that's what the problem description was, then this is correct. Is it just convention to always put the primary key like first in the table? So is it convention to list the primary key first in the table? Convention probably not officially, not really, but you know mostly it just kind of makes sense to put it there. So I have actually rearranged this. So if we go back to here, right. I had since yeah. in the middle because we didn't really know what the key was yet, and then I kind of rearranged it. SSN and DID have to be next to each other in order for me to show the primary key like right. this. So that's just why I rearranged it. Okay. Yes. If we wanted the employees to be able to work. Um, multiple durations, what the primary key then includes since? If we wanted the employees to be able to work multiple durations, first, we would have started with a different ER diagram. Um, so there is there is really no way to translate this ER diagram into that problem. But yes, eventually, basically what it would result in, the different ER diagram would result in the since attribute being part of the key. Okay, one more. So does that mean that with this ER diagram, it would always be the case that the two primary keys together, or sorry, the two foreign keys together would make it the primary key, you can't have it? Right, so with this ER diagram, it is always the case that SSN and DID are the primary key of the works in the table. Because the translation is procedural. Like, this is the rule, this is how you do it. If you wanted it, if you wanted a different meaning, then you would have had to come up with a different ER diagram in the first place. So the rule is then is that if you have a relationship, and the, the primary keys and the things that relate to it are combined together to make Right. So the rule for a many-to-many -many relationship is the, the primary keys of the two entities that it is relating become the primary key of the, of the middle table, the relation table. Okay, what about one-to-many? So, first of all, what does this mean in English? So this is manages now. This is not works in. This is an employee can manage potentially multiple departments, and, but a department can only have one manager. And really that line on the department side should be bold, but we're leaving participation constraints off for now. We'll get to how to how to incorporate those into the translation to schema. So here's the basic meaning. The difference is a <coughs> department can now have one manager. So as a first attempt, we could kind of just do the same thing we did for many to many. We could make a new table. So manages could become its own table. We pull in the primary keys from the two relating entity sets. And it, it kind of works the same way. This, this, this would work, but, but we'll see there's a better way to do it. If we did it this way, um, what is the primary key of the new table? So in the old, in, in the many-to-many, -many, 
we said the primary key is the combination of both foreign keys. If we did that here, that would give a different meaning. Since this is one to many, we want the primary key to just be the department ID, saying a department can only show up in this manages table once, meaning a department can only have one manager. So this is where using the same, the same formulation of translating a many-to-many -many, uh, relationship doesn't quite work out the way we want it to. So here's a better option. Since a department can only have one manager, why not just say who its manager is right there in the department's table? We can just add a column saying, here's a pointer to an employee, and the title of that column is manager. So in other words, we merge the manages relationship with the department's entity set. So we take all of the manages attributes, including budget, that means the budget now has to be part of the department. And so we end up with this. We take the manager's attributes. We also have to take the key from the other table and add it as a foreign key to the department's table. OK. What about not null? So all these other attributes are just not null because it doesn't make sense for, for an employee to not have a name. What about this? Not null on manager and, and managed since. Um, it's not always just yes and it's not always just no. It depends. What it depends on is, does the department have to have a manager? Right? So what would it mean for this, for this manager column to be null? That would mean some department doesn't have a manager. So we go to the ER diagram to answer that question. Was the line bold? Is participation required or not? If it is required, we specify not null. If it's optional, this is where it would be incorrect to specify not null. So it is, it's not just that like you, you pick one. You, it has a very different meaning. We have to allow null if we want a department to be unmanaged. So is the manager actually so the manager is the key from the employee's entity set, which is social security number. Yeah. We just need, we need a pointer to a specific entity. The way we identify an entity of that type is through social security number. Okay. So let me, so let, let's, let's look at this on the right. I have a foreign key constraint plus I'm allowing for null. So remember, a foreign key constraint means if I add a row to that table, then the value in the foreign key column has to exist in the referenced table. So this seems to be a contradiction. I have to be able to allow null here, but null doesn't point to any employee. So if you have a, it does allow for a foreign key to have, have a null value, and in that case, referential integrity is not enforced. Because it, you, know, you have to be able to allow for, for this particular meaning. Normally, a foreign key means you cannot insert a tuple if the value in the foreign key column doesn't point to a real foreign thing. In this case, with the way we have it set up, could you have a budget without having a manager? So could you have a budget without having a manager? In this particular case, yeah. Because I'm allowing for these things to either exist or not exist. And there's no constraints saying that they have to exist together. You could add an additional constraint uh, saying that you, you, you have to check the other column before you add, before you change the value of the budget. Um, or sorry, of the manage since. Say that again, an attribute can be a foreign key without, without being the primary key of the table that it originates in. Without being the primary key of the table that it originates in. It has to be the primary key, it has to be a key 
of the foreign table. Right. So manager is, is pointing to SSN, which is the key of the employees table. It ha a foreign key has to be, it's not a key in the department's table, but it has to point to a foreign key. So the okay, so a primary key can't be null, but a foreign key can be. So that does kind of conflict. So basically, what it means, if you allow the foreign key to be null, it means that that entity does not have to participate in the relationship. So in this particular example, a what this means is a department does not have to have a manager. So yes, it is allowed to be null as a foreign key, because it's not a key in the department's table, but it is not allowed to be null in the employee's table. So there's kind of a slight disconnect because of the meaning of pointing to a key versus being a key. Yeah. So we had two ways um, that you've presented so far, like setting up this uh, ER schema conversion. And in one of them, it looked like Budget could not exist unless there was a manager, uh, like unless there was a management relationship. But in this one, it seems like you could have a row that has budget but has no manager. Is there a way? Right. So in this, oh, you know what? I have. I kind of have these columns missing. So manage since should say budget there, uh, because that uh, manage since came from the relationship that it came from that relationship attribute? Is, is, I guess my main question is, is there a way to enforce the constraint that you can't have a manager without a budget? So, right, so can you enforce the constraint that if manager is null, then budget must be null? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, you can't, so it, it's, it's through an additional kind of constraint that we haven't talked about yet, but we'll get to it. Okay. Okay. So, back to our naive library that we came up with without thinking about entities and relationships. We kind of just tried to dive right into the relational model and say these are the relations. Um, this is, it works and it's correct, but if we had actually drawn an ER diagram first, um, there would be a relationship between inventory and patrons, and that relationship is a patron can check out one of the books from the inventory. And if we had drawn that diagram correctly, we would have come up with this set of tables. So a book can only be checked out by one patron. It was a one-to-many relationship, not a many-to-many, -many, so we would not have created a, a whole table for the checked out information. We would just merge that into inventory and allow it to be null, meaning if a book's checked out by a value is null, then the book is available. It's not checked out. And we can put that in one column because two people can't check out the same book. They can check out the, a book with the same ISBN, but different serial numbers, different copies of the same book. So to refresh, Foreign keys can be null, but they cannot point to a value that doesn't exist. Foreign keys can be null, but they cannot point to a value that doesn't exist. Right. Okay. So, the difference between this and this. As I said, they're both, they'll both solve the problem. They'll both work. Um, this one is better, not only because it kind of more clearly defines the problem, but because Remember, the way that we get information out of these tables, let me go back a bit, is say we want to know all the books checked out by Joe. We have to like, kind of join these tables together, combine them in a certain way and in order to follow these references. That's called joining, which we'll talk about, but basically the fewer tables you have to join, the better performance will be. 
and the fewer tables you have in general, the fewer joins you will have to do to, to get to the information you want. Okay, what about one to one? Um, we can treat it as one to many and then just kind of pick one of them to merge the relationship into. So if an employee can work for one department and a department, or sorry, if an employee can manage one department and a department can have one manager, I could take the key from either of those tables and put it into the other table in order to uh, define that relationship. And you, additionally, you specify that it is unique. So wherever you pull the foreign key in from, you say it's unique because it's one-to-one. -one. What if, so how do we pick? Like, I picked, I'll merge from right to left. I could have merged from left to right. Sometimes it matters. In this case, it doesn't. When it matters, it's based on participation constraints. So if a department has to have a manager, then we have to merge the manager's key into the department's table and make it make it not null, make it unique. Okay. And then finally, weak entities and their supporting relationships. So it's always a one-to-many relationship. So we kind of follow the same rules as a one-to-many. We were going to merge. Um, the slight difference is when when picking the primary key of the weak entity set, we have to remember to pull in the primary key of the supporting entity set. Yes? Does a weak entity always have a foreign key? Does a weak entity set always have a, a foreign key? Yes. Because it has, it does, doesn't, can't exist by itself. It depends on some foreign entity. I see, but like just because a schema has a foreign key doesn't make it a weak entity. Right, so not the other way around. A foreign key does not mean it's a weak entity because a foreign key can be null. Right. Yes. So in this case, there's only going to be one table then? So there would be the courses table, and there would be the classes table. Oh. Right. The supporting relationship doesn't become its own table. It's, it's just like any other one-to-many. You merge the relationship into the entity set to create one table. So, so how do you? How do you know that you have an entity set based on your table? We can based on the schema. You can't go from schema to ER. You, can, you, you go from ER to schema. Yeah. You kind of lose, lose a little bit of information. Okay, there's a problem here. Um, what if participation is required on both sides of a relationship? That would mean that you have a a foreign key in the left table pointing to the right table, and a foreign key in the right table pointing to the left table. Remember, a foreign key means you can't insert a tuple without it pointing to something in the other table. So if I say, say the tables are initially empty, I'm going to create the first employee. It has to have a department, but no departments exist yet. Okay, so let's create the first department. It has to have an employee, but no employees exist yet. So it's kind of like a chicken and egg problem, and there's no good way to capture this in uh, schema design. What we do instead is just in software, when generating SQL commands, we just kind of go and make sure that these constraints are upheld um, kind of one at a time. If you have this kind of situation, would a solution be to just incorporate the manager's relationship into a single table that contains both entities that are required to participate? So could you incorporate, to solve this, could you just put both, merge both entities into a single table? Yeah. If it's many to many, then that table would have a ton of uh, duplicate information, potentially. Okay. So I know this is looks small on the projector. I'm going to kind of go through a summary of the algorithm, more for like you'll you'll be able to refer to this slide um, at, at a later time. I know you may not be able to read that from the back. Also, I know these projectors are dim, 
Uh, I contacted support, and they said, yep, the projectors are dim. <laughs> it's due to be upgraded, but probably not this semester, unfortunately. Okay, so if we have some, some ent two entity sets and a relationship, they have, so each entity set has some set of attributes. So right here I have A1 through AN. And if you can see, A1 is underlined, so that's the primary key. Um, there's some unknown cardinality. The relationship set can have its own attributes, R1 through RK. And then the other entity set has B1 through BM with a key. So based on cardinality and participation constraints, how do we, like, what is just like the general rules for translating this into, into schema? If it's many to many, then we have two, we have a table for each entity set with its key. And then we have a new table for the relationship. The, re, the key of the, of the relationship table is the key of A plus the key of B. Um, and then it has all of its own relationship attributes, R1 through RK. So red here also denotes foreign key. So I have underlining and red. So A1 is a foreign key, B1 is a foreign key. The combination of the both is the primary key of the relationship table. If it's one to many with one on the left, um, we end up with just two tables. But we pull, the, we pull the key from the left one into the right one. So A1 is a foreign key in E2's table. If it's the other way around, we pull the key in the opposite direction, the foreign key. If it's one to one, we treat it as one to many and pick which side to merge, which direction to merge. Sometimes there's not a choice if based on participation constraints. If one of them has to participate, that decides which way we merge. Yes? So the one to many. Depending on the table you merge, you also bring all of the attributes with the relationship. Right, so, if it's, so whenever we're merging a relationship with an entity set, we bring all the attributes of the relationship into the table as well. We can't just lose those attributes, they're, they're there for a reason. Yeah? And you said we convert this by again, we would have to access it? Yeah, so, right, so this full thing, after I built it up, you know, kind of one thing at a time. This full thing is what you'll want for, for later reference. And yes, I post all the slides on Canvas. Um, and so you're allowed five pages of notes on exams. This might be something you might want to put on those five pages. Make sure you understand it, though. You know, Don't just say, like, OK, well, that'll explain it to me at, at the time, and I'll be able to, to figure out its meaning. Yeah. Make sure you know what these underlines mean, what the red, red means, and so on. Okay, and then finally, so kind of in addition to that summary, not null is not really captured here. Um, not null is determined usually by participation constraints. If we have total participation on both sides, it's difficult to capture with schema design, and we'll do it later in a more custom way. Okay, that's it for today. See you later.